Hello, hello and welcome. Welcome folks. I see, I see Amy Poehler has joined us. No, just joking, but I love that. I, I got really excited because I thought maybe it was actually her. Um, thanks everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, I am Shadi. I'm with the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project. We are just going to give folks a couple minutes to get settled. Um, thank you for being with us today. And as always, you can have your video on. We love seeing your faces. Um, I also know that we're back in full on homeschooling. Um, so if you'd rather have your video off or if you're juggling a million things as most of us are, feel free to do whatever you need um, to participate um, in the way that makes the most sense for you. Um, while we wait for um, everyone else to arrive, uh, just by way of either hands up or thumbs up on your uh, little emoji button, um, how many of you have attended at least half of our monthly sessions? Oh, cool. Awesome. Looks like about about half of us. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you to those who have been able to join for a lot of sessions and welcome to those who are here for your first session. Um, I'm going to get us started. Uh, we've got a pretty full slate today. Um, but first wanted to just do a little bit of Zoom orientation for today's call. Um, you again, welcome to have your video on. We love to see your faces. You can turn it off if that's more flexible for you. Um, throughout the discussion, you are welcome to chat questions in the chat box. I will be regularly taking a look at that um, and happy to bring those questions in either right at that moment or we'll bring them back in into the Q&A. So that's a great place to, to chat your questions. Um, and also please, you know, just let us know where you're, where you're dialing in from today. Um, you can just pop that in the chat box. We usually get folks from all over the country. Um, we sometimes even have people from other parts of the world. Um, so would love to hear from you. And um, you manage your own audio and video. If you are getting a little loud, we might need to um, manage that on our end, um, but hopefully not. <laughs> um, I actually have some construction happening outside my house, so I'm gonna be on mute um, when I'm not speaking. Okay, so before we uh, fully jump in, and I'm loving seeing this. We've got folks from all over the country. Thank you for being here with us. Um, we're in some crazy times. <laughs> uh, I know I'm in, in the Bay Area. We've got a lot of California folks on the line, a lot of West Coast folks on the line. Um, it's been really uh, uh, an intense few weeks with the wildfires across the West Coast. Um, adding to the tremendous amount of stress and chaos that we're experiencing in every other possible way. Um, and to, to boot, the start of the school year. So now people are juggling homeschooling on top of everything again. So um, before we really kind of jump into today's content, let's just acknowledge the reality that we are in. Um, and it's not easy. And um, things are pretty rough. And that's just, that's the way it is. Fortunately, we have these spaces to be connected with colleagues and um, like-minded allies. And uh, that, that gives me a little bit of solace. And I hope you can find that too in today's discussion. But before we kind of get back into our heads, maybe let's just get into our bodies. So um, a little breathing exercise, if you'll, if you'll indulge me. Um, if you can, get your feet flat on the ground. Close your eyes. Release all the stale air and let's breathe together. Inhale, five, four, three, two, one. Hold it at the top. Exhale, five, four, three, two, one. One more time. Inhale, five, four, three, two, one. Hold it. Exhale, five, four, three, two, one. Let's do that one more time. Inhale, five, four, 
three, two, one. Sip in one more little breath of air if you can, and then let it all go. <sighs> Whew, thank you. Okay, so now we can, now we're ready. <laughs> now we're ready to jump in. Um, so welcome, we, we've got a, a really great program today. Um, some wonderful speakers. This is our final webinar of this series, but we've got some other good stuff coming up that we'll be talking about toward the end of the call. Um, but in this final series, um, actually, I'm going to do a little screen share. Hold on one second. Okay, so this is the final um, of a seven part series that has been in collaboration with Philanthropy California and the Trust Based Philanthropy Project. Uh, as you, many of you know, the Trust Based Philanthropy Project is a five year initiative to um, build learning and advocacy around trust based practices in the sector and uh, contribute to a culture shift in the sector to make trust based practices the norm. Uh, this is the final of our series. You can see the full slate here. We have all the recordings of our past sessions on the Trust Based Philanthropy Resources page. So you can just do that. You can just um, go to trustbasedphilanthropy.org, uh, click on the resources tab, and you can find all the past recordings of these past sessions as a record. So this is our final um, of, of the series, and we wanted to wrap up this series with a deeper discussion around what does it actually look like to make the case for this work and what is the work of making the case for trust-based philanthropy? What does that look like? What is the role of leadership? What is the role of building a trust-based culture? What, how, do, how can we actually make this work stick for the long haul? So this is really where we're gonna be um, focused on today. We've got a fabulous set of speakers, um, some of whom you may recognize, um, we've got Phil Lee, who's the president and CEO of the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, Brenda Solorsano, who is the CEO of the Headwaters Foundation in Montana, Pian Fonte, who's co-executive director of the Whitman Institute, um, and our special guest, Marcus Walton, who's the president and CEO of Grantmakers for Effective Organizations, also known as GEO. Um, we're thrilled to have these speakers today because not only will we be hearing from uh, some of the co-founders of the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project um, in, in talking about kind of these deeper aspects of the work. We'll also be hearing from Marcus, who brings a kind of bird's eye view, but also has done a lot of work around the culture building aspect in philanthropy. So we're going to really be get digging in beneath the principles. We've spent a long time, we've spent six months thus far, really examining each of the trust-based principles um, in detail, which has been really, really great. But today's takeaway we want, want everyone to understand is that there's a, an aspect of this work that goes much deeper than the principles and the practices. It has to do with culture, values, and leadership. And we're gonna be talking about what does that actually look like? Um, but before we jump into that, um, you know, just a, re just a refresher on what we're talking about with trust-based philanthropy. You know, we, this work exists within an ecosystem wherein relationships are the kind of connecting nodes of everything that we do. So we must prioritize building those trust-based relationships, prioritizing dialogue, transparency, and learning, and modeling what a trust-based culture looks like. If we can prioritize those types of relationships and have leaders that, that model what trust-based values look like, then it can ripple out into how our organizations operate, how our organizations can collaborate with each other, and how that kind of ripples out into the greater kind of society as a whole. So we wanna think about really, this, when we talk about culture, when we talk about values, we're talking, talking about all of that in the context of this ecosystem. And the values really center on leading with trust, centering relationships, 
collaborating with humility, humility and curiosity, committing to redistributing power toward building our collective power, and working for systemic equity. These are kind of the values that will be kind of touched upon throughout today's discussion. And just a reminder that these are the touchstones of a trust-based approach. We will not be going in depth into the principles today, um, but just a reminder, a refresher on what the principles are. Um, you know, it's all about freeing up nonprofits so that they can focus on their work, on their mission critical work and building mutual, mutually beneficial relationships and partnerships. All of those values are really fully embodied in these six principles. And as a trust-based approach, we advocate for the holistic practice of these six principles. Uh, so, because when practiced together, that's when they can really advance this vision for trust-based philanthropy. So when we talk about making the case, making the case for a trust-based approach, uh, in many ways, and in, in, in prepping with our speakers today, we really had a moment to reflect on how this current moment we're in with the convergence of, you know, what seems to be, you know, countless crises that we're experiencing. These moments and these, these crises are actually kind of doing some of that making the case work for us. Um, this moment is making the case for many of these principles. And we have seen many funders including many of you on this call today, have begun to take many steps that really embody a trust-based approach in order to be more responsive to nonprofit and community needs in this moment as we reckon with um, a racial reckoning and a global pandemic um, and climate change. There's so many things going on. And so many of us are taking action in order to be more supportive of our nonprofit and community needs. Um, we're seeing funders unrestricting grants that were previously restricted. Um, folks are shortening uh, their applications and streamlining reporting requirements or even getting rid of reporting requirements. Um, people are, funders are moving money more quickly and coming up with ways to do that because of the urgency of the times. And there's a lot of examples of funders offering support beyond the check um, through moral support um, and many other ways in response to this moment. So this is great. This is very promising. It's very encouraging. Um, but the reality is there's a case to be made for this kind of deeper part of the practice. And it's an opportunity for us to radically reimagine how we understand and approach philanthropy in relationship to communities. How can we think differently about making these streamlined practices stick for the long haul? And how can and what is the work to be done to make sure that we can imbue a trust based culture and values in our work for not just this current moment, but for the long haul. What does that actually look like. Um, so that's what we're here to discuss today. We'll be digging into that. We'll be kind of unpacking what we mean by culture values leadership. What is that. How do we do that. How do we build buy in in those ways. Uh, but we're also, I also know that you might have some really nitty gritty questions where you might be getting stuck in your own work, in your own efforts to build the case for this practice. And we want to create some space for those questions as well. So know that while we'll be kind of talking, we'll be starting a little big so we can talk about some of the, these kind of bigger, more values driven aspects of the work. Um, but we invite you to bring in your super practical questions too, because we are really hoping that um, this can be a, a useful um, step in your ongoing journey to embrace and build buy-in for trust-based philanthropy. Okay, so that's, that's my whole spiel. I'm gonna take us off screen. Um, and I'd love to bring it into our wonderful speakers. And so we're gonna start today's discussion with a big question that I'd love for all four of our speakers to address. And the question is, and we're going to start with you, Pia. So now that the case is already being made for trust-based practices, what are the other aspects of a trust-based approach that we really need to work on right now and continue to make the case for? Um, thanks, Shadi. Um, thanks, Shadi. Good to see everyone, uh, be with everyone, even if I can't see you. Um, I appreciate your naming, Shadi, that the world is 
making the case for trust-based philanthropy left and right. Um, one of the one of the lessons we've been learning because we are learners, we don't actually hold ourselves to be some kind of perfect um, model that has you know, that we need to stop evolving. <laughs> I think everyone on this call um, who's speaking thinks of themselves as a lifelong learner and thinks of our organizations as constantly learning. And so um, this intersection of all these pandemics in this moment just continue to highlight for us the connection between trust-based philanthropy and racial equity work. Uh, they, they're not in, in our minds, you know, that kind of the kind of culture change process that it takes to bring about a trust-based and integrated trust-based um, approach and culture is really uh, the, the same uh, as doing, you know, having the intention to create like a racial justice, racial equity um, culture in our organizations. So I used to be an organizational development consultant and I would always turn down work where the people said we have, you know, dedicated uh, two hours of a lunch and learn to do DEI and we would like you to come do it. Um, in the, you know, on a parallel track, the organization would have committed, you know, 12 to 18 months to a strategic planning process and organizational development process. Um, and many more dollars to that uh, to that process. So I used to say, why why is your DEI budget and time, you know, the size of like a, a grain of rice? And then, you know, your strategy work is, you know, buckets and buckets and buckets. And so same here that, you know, you can kind it, it in some ways when you look very swiftly at trust based philanthropy, it looks like, oh, okay. These are just um, a set of protocols or you know, measures to do better grant making or more effective grant making. And the answer is yes and. I think most of us um, either pressed by the urgency of you know, what, sorry, we're from California, so it's been pretty apocalyptic, right? We've got orange skies, we've got air we can't breathe. So that feels pretty urgent, but even before this moment in time, even before this 2020 year, we had already been thinking and talking about um, trust-based philanthropy as basically a change effort um, within organizations that is um, sort of like lives hand in hand with a lot of change efforts that are really centered on racial equity. And I know the rest of the panelists will also address this, but I'll, I'll just end by saying um, it's impossible to be in this country right now and not think about race. Um, maybe depending on where, who, and what we listen to, we're thinking about race differently. But for us, the values of um, you know, being accountable and listening to our nonprofit and community partners um, and really honoring the experience of what it is like um, for our you know, black and brown communities, undocumented communities, um, the levels of violence and unemployment and um, kind of all the markers of um, oppression are being lived and I think that in order to honor that, um, we are accountable to that lived experience. We must um, integrate a racial justice or racial equity perspective to everything that we do as individual leaders and as institutions. Thank you so much, Pia. Thank you for acknowledging some of these kind of greater pieces that really go beyond the principles, but are core to a trust-based um, kind of values-driven approach. Um, Phil, I'm gonna turn next to you, Phil Lee from Robert Sterling Clark Foundation. So now that the case is already being made for the practical practices and principles, what are some other aspects of, trust, of a trust-based approach that, that you see as important to highlight as part of this building buy-in uh, discussion? Hi, everybody, nice to be with you. Um, I think building a little bit on what Pia was talking about in terms of this moment and um, kind of racial equity and this notion of being accountable to our grantee partners and to listen and learn from them. I think Trustbase offers that opportunity in a way that some others don't uh, with kind of this notion of a multi-year and unrestricted type of grant making. It, it engages us in a different kind of relationship and also it frees up our grantee partners to think about the work that they're doing in different ways, right? And I think one of the biggest things that comes from that is 
this notion to think about a bigger picture or to be experimental or to think about things in a different way, really kind of to put on a hat that might be uh, viewed as like, think about systems and systems change and what kind of work can be done and what kinds of things can be done and tried out um, when you have that freedom or you have the ability to know that you are secure in some funding to do that work. And so I think that's one of the big things and big opportunities that uh, comes with that. You know, I, I like to talk and maybe this is kind of where my own financial kind of hat comes back, but I really do look at um, philanthropic dollars as the risk capital of the sector. And um, it's where government can't go and corporations choose, is often choose not to in terms of when they do support. But this isn't a, a chance for our kind of grantee partners who are closer to the ground, who are doing the work, who have lived experience to actually put into play and to try out things that they think are possible ways to solve some of these kind of seemingly intractable problems. And I think kind of that latitude and that freedom and also giving them the opportunity to come back to us, right, is a different kind of relationship. So maybe we can be council or a sounding board or something like that along the way, or even provide some of the frameworks and big pictures that we see as funders is part of that opportunity to think about the ways that things can change and be different in our country. And so I think kind of trust base opens that window and opens that door to kind of experimentation that can lead to different ways of approaching systems change. Thank you, Phil. I love that. I love that um, thinking about philanthropic dollars as risk, risk capital for the sector. Um, I, I really like that framing. Um, really great way to think about it. Um, Brenda, what, what comes up for you um, as we see this case being made for the practical elements of trust-based philanthropy? What are some of the other areas that we need to work, work on in the sector? Good morning, everyone. Greetings from big sky country. Uh, we're actually getting to breathe some of the smoke from the West Coast fires that are floating their way over here. Um, I'm really delighted to be with you here today to talk about this um, change effort. Um, and when you think about change effort, you need to think about uh, what is the leadership that is required to lead a change effort. And I think that's a big component of trust-based philanthropy that sometimes folks want to get into the very practical of like what I need to do without really pausing and asking what's the change effort and what's my role in leading that change effort. Um, because we really are talking about uh, taking a very different uh, fundamental approach to how we do our work. Um, and you know, prior to coming to Headwaters, I had spent 17 year, years in philanthropy and I almost left philanthropy because I felt like uh, we were getting in the way of real change and felt like this might not be the space in which I could maybe play my best role in, in being part of something positive. And uh, then got to come to Headwaters and really uh, be in a very different space of saying, how can we reinvent the business model of philanthropy and go from a top-down approach to one that really truly centers the community in, in the leadership position? And so how do, you, how do you become a CEO of a foundation and not be the kind of ego-driven leader, but rather a leader that is listening, that is being transparent, that is adhering to some real core fundamental values that you need in order to, to lead a trust-based organization and to be in true community and to really be supportive of the social justice change work that needs to happen. So leadership for me is a, is a, is a critical component of this. And one of the things I would ask everyone who is on this call um, to ponder on now and after you leave this call is what leadership role are you playing within your organization and within the field of philanthropy to drive this change that we're talking about that is embodied by trust-based philanthropy. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks for, for really underscoring the importance of that and reminding us that we all play somewhat of a leadership role regardless of what our official title is. Um, and so we all have a part to play in this. Um, and we'll get back to this leadership piece um, a little later. Um, but before that, I want to, I would love to hear from you, Marcus, um, you know, what's coming up for you as, as the uh, leader of kind of the, you know, a large organization that, that organizes a lot of um, uh, foundations across the country. Um, so you've got kind of a bird's eye view on what's 
happening. You've done a lot of work around kind of this role of culture in philanthropy in the sector. So what comes up for you when you think about, you know, now that the case is being made for these practices, what are these other aspects of a trust-based approach that we really need to, to continue to make the case for? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it really is a, a, a pleasure isn't the right word, although I do get so much gratification uh, from being a part of these conversations, but it's, a, it's more of an honor uh, to be able to, in the spirit of being a learning leader, as Pia mentioned, uh, really contribute some observations and experiences to this conversation to help advance um, this movement that has been uh, structured around trust-based philanthropy. Uh, I really appreciate this personally and as a representative of um, the Grant Makers for Effective Organizations, which has for a decade or more um, promoted the kinds of principles that align with uh, this this body of work. So the flexible and reliable funding, general operating support, uh, emphasizing capacity building, learning, evaluation, coordination, all of these uh, are central to uh, the work of, of the GEO that after a year I've inherited. And as we look forward and think about a vision for responding to moments like the current moment, uh, appreciating that change is ever present, uh, we really do uh, emphasize the importance of culture in a way that you described it. Um, and we've actually uh, revised our mission uh, to see ourselves as a forum of grant makers uh, where we come together to foster um, the kind of grant making practices that focus on just not just culture, but also on uh, the supporting thriving nonprofits and communities. So, there's a way in which uh, when we talk about culture, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is uh, the extent to which we are not in this alone. Right? So it's not about Marcus and however much ex experience and knowledge I may believe I've accumulated over the years, um, believing that I have the silver bullet and now is the time for me to, to uh, uh, demand and promote a, a, a uh, pathway forward. Instead, to me, this is about us uh, coming together, learning of, alongside each other, which is a critical component of uh, the GEO community. And from that learning al alongside each other, from the introduction of the kinds of resources and expertise uh, amongst us, um, uh, really cultivating the wisdom of our collective genius, right? This is our shared power. And, and I, I love to use the, the idea of power here, our shared genius, um, because as, as several of you mentioned, this is a real commitment to change. Right? So this is, this is not a status quo experience, a navigation as much as a transformation exercise. Uh, in, in order to do that, as leaders, as, as was already described, there's a way in which we position ourselves uh, to facilitate change. Uh, and racial equity as an approach uh, to facilitate change has, has been promoted and, and there's been some promising results uh, over time to that end. Uh, Brenda mentioned this is about leadership, Phil about systems thinking. All of these things working together have to do with uh, a vision for the sector that we now have an opportunity to uh, be intentional about um, uh, defining together. Uh, so as a representative of this broader community of grant makers, the invitation for me is to consider what is our aspirational vision for the sector and how does trust-based philanthropy and aligned approaches to the work help us arrive at a set of common agendas that allow us to bring our best to the work. And the last part of all that I'll say is uh, that we often talk about power in terms of seeding power, uh, a kind of a giving away, someone giving and someone getting. Uh, I like to offer that um, there's a way in which we might consider power as how we cultivate and build it in those spaces where it is lacking, in those spaces where it might contribute to a more a powerful impact, a more concerted and sharpened voice uh, speaking 
uh, on behalf of those whose access to a platforms may not be as uh, visible or as uh, uh, directly connected to the power sources, the levers of power to affect the change that we want to see. And so I just invite us all to consider the different ways in which we might think and talk about seeding power, how we might reframe those, and how we do this across generations. Right? When I think about racial equity, I think about the historical origins of present conditions. And so how do we think about the generations that we will be impacting ahead and how our decisions now can contribute to the kinds of impact that, that uh, result in thriving communities that align with this aspirational vision in the sector for thriving. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, it's really uh, encouraging to think about it that way. It's inspiring to think about our work in this way. This is a real opportunity for a collective imagining. I mean, look, we've got over 100 people um, here today having this discussion. So this is, we're in this together. We are genuinely in this together. Everyone has brought some level of commitment to this work and that is power to have, you know, these many voices together in this kind of learning session. Um, and it's just one's kind of sliver of, of the kind of broader community that's engaging around these ideas. Um, I love this reframing of seeding power. So when we're saying seeding power, we often refer to the C-E-D-E -E of seeding power. Um, and that can be a bit of a sticking point for some, for some audiences. That feels, it's a challenging way to enter into the discussion when we're talking about giving up some power and giving off, you know, giving some power to others. Um, and by the way, shout out to NCRP. Thank you to Iris who flagged NCRP's great work. Um, power moves that really digs into this, um, these concepts. We encourage you to check that out. Um, Marcus, I really like this reframing um, from seeding power to kind of, you know, building collective power. Um, and I would love to hear from all of our speakers. You know, what are some, you know, that, that's an alternate way of thinking about and talking about seeding power, but does, what does that really look like? What does that bring up for you? How do you embody this kind of sharing power, building collective power in your work. Um, and I'd love to start um, with Brenda, just kind of, you know, what, what does that raise for you? And how are you kind of thinking about power and building collective power in your work? And how, it's, how are you having those conversations with your board and your, your staff? I think, Shadi, this um, brings me back to the notion that I was talking about previously around leadership playing, playing a role here. And what is, what does it mean to be a leader? And how can a leader um, be a leader while simultaneously build leadership and empowerment in, in other individuals and other organizations? Um, and when, when I've been doing this work, um, I often have to remind myself that, um, yes, I'm a leader, but my job is to build leadership and capacity in others to be able to lead in this change up. Um, and that has required conversations with my staff about you may be the expert on this issue or you may have a deep understanding um, and your role as a leader is not to lead with that, but to rather create opportunities for those who have not been at the table to have a say in how do you define what the work is and how the, the work should look and move forward. Um, and that requires my staff to let go of them being the ones that are there to dictate, right? Um, so it's a very different role for, for my staff. I think with the board, it has really required a conversation of if, if the board is not going to be in the position of making decisions on everything, then what is the purpose and value add of the board? And what is their leadership role? And if you don't answer that question, I have found that that's when you get into trouble. And so part of my work has been sitting down and having conversations with individual board members and with the collective board to say, okay, so your role in this change effort is to actually model what does it mean to build collective power in others? What does it mean for you to stay at a governance level um, and not be the ones that have the answers and make the decisions. Um, and that's a challenging conversation for a board 
because people come to board service with the understanding that the buck stops here, right? And, um, and then a lot of board members join foundation boards because they believe that they are gonna get to be the ones that say who's gonna receive funding and what is the work gonna be. And when you shift that, which I have at Headwaters, our board does not review and approve grants. If you shift that, then you've got to fill it in with some other way for them to, to lead. And, and things that I've been doing for my board is creating opportunities for my board chair to talk about what does it mean to lead without approving grants, um, has meant what does it mean to lead in your community so that you can be playing a role as a trustee asking the hard questions that need to be asked um, about uh, change efforts that need to happen. Um, and then I think for me personally in the field of philanthropy, my job doesn't just mean I stay within the walls of the foundation here at Headwaters or that I stay within the geography boundaries of Montana. My job is to be part of this learning community and figure out how I can share what I'm doing, how I can learn from others, and how I can play a leadership role in changing the practices that, that have been standard practices in philanthropy. Thank you so much for that, Brenda. Thank you for modeling what it looks like to be a humble uh, and trust-based leader. Um, and thank you for raising, kind of encouraging us to interrogate what these traditional notions of leadership are and how they show up in these different roles. Um, you know, the role of the board, you know, I know that's probably coming up for many of you um, as you're having discussions with your colleagues and, and your board members, um, challenging some of the, the assumptions of what it means to be a board and the board's role. Um, you know, we've taken some tips from Brenda and others who have really worked to rethink, um, you know, how to really leverage the value of a board. And I just popped into the chat box. We, we just, um, just finalized a resource that really highlights the role of a trust-based board. Um, and this is directly influenced by feedback from Brenda and others um, and, and also some trustees as well to really kind of think about how can we leverage the valuable contributions that board members bring and how do we think of it in a different way that is about building collective power. So please check that out. Let us know how it goes you know, share it with your board members. Um, but it does get at a lot of what Brenda was talking about that encourages us to think more expansively about leadership um, in a trust-based system. Um, next, I'd love to move on to you, Pia. When we talk about this idea of leadership and building collective power, um, what, what comes up for you and, and, and what are some ways that we can um, how can we interrogate some of these traditional notions and rethink what what our roles are in this sector when we kind of factor in all these different elements? Yeah, I want to talk about two things. So the Whitman Institute is spending out and we are closing our doors within about the next two years, almost 18 months. So one of the ways we think of this overall strategic um, move, move to spend out is actually in a trust-based frame. And if you um, integrate a racial equity frame. It's about um, giving up the power to decide, you know, um, giving up the organization and the institution itself, so not living in perpetuity. So we see our spend out as a trust based spend out in which we've listened to our partners. Um, we've at this point transferred most of the um, wealth out to our long term nonprofit and movement partners. Um, and we've acknowledged that maybe the best contribution we could make is to um, help other folks see that, um, you know, one of the ways that we give up power is to even give up the notion that our institutions have to exist forever. Um, so that's just one way and you can look and read more about our spend out or talk to me about that. And the other one is much more personal and interpersonal. I think as professionalized philanthropy, um, we can in different ways, and I'm sure I'm guilty of it myself, accrue a kind of power that we don't even recognize. And so I'm thinking in particular that when folks see our materials, they think, oh yeah, it's the trustees that have to give up power. It's the, you know, it's kind of um, this, this vague idea that there's a they and they have to give up power. It's very rarely do we think it's me, <laughs> me, I have to give up power, especially if we're not the president, the CEO or a trustee. 
But in these um, complex change in engagements around um, moving towards trust-based philanthropy that I've been a part of, I've noticed also that sometimes program officers or program directors or operation staff or finance or legal teams um, have a difficult time um, reconceptualizing their role. Um, and, and just as we want trustees to reconceptualize their role, and I saw something great from Peter here that you know they had reconceptualized their board's role, just as we want our boards to reconceptualize their roles, every other role also has to be reconceptualized and imagined from you know, grants management to legal and finance. Um, and, and so I think that sometimes we, we have this um, sense that it's them that must give up power and you know, we are the ones that are often without power, but we can all take a moment to reflect on the sphere of influence that we actually have, right? The decisions that are on our plate, the, in our work plan. And how do we go about that work? Is it collaborative? Is it collective? Do we take feedback? Whose feedback do we listen to? Um, are we willing to be countercultural in our organization if our organization isn't, you know, trust-based, philanthropy-based, or isn't trying to move towards racial equity or thinks that they are, but they're, you know, they're, they're sort of in, we're in, going in circles about it. And again, we're, 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 more, we're less about judging and more about learning. So I think that if we remove the sensibility that there's some kind of perfect destination, there's some kind of, you know, point at which me and my organization will get an A plus and we'll be done, but that we'll all need to constantly evolve um, in, in ourselves. And I, I think that that's, you know, so the institutional strategic decisions is one area and then kind of individual how we hold personal power decisions, even as minute as how long it takes us to respond to an, an unsolicited email from maybe um, a hopeful nonprofit leader, right? So do we ever respond? What do we respond? How, you know, like those kinds of things demonstrate our willingness to empathize with what it's like to not be in our role. And, and uh, last thing is, again, I was an organizational development consultant and so often, what happens in an, in an organization almost mimics a family. So the leadership is like the parents and the staff is sort of like either the rowdy kids or the compliant kids. And I think sometimes when we're not in those leadership roles, we don't see ourselves as folks who have something to give up or something to reconsider or something to reconfigure. Um, the last thing is like, what are we accountable to? Is it the mission, our values and our constituents? Or are we accountable to the endowment um, and to the notion that our job is to preserve it and protect the money versus to support and to listen to the people. Thank you, Pia. There's so much good stuff in there. Um, you know, one, beginning to think about our roles in the work and really kind of challenging traditional notions of what those roles are. Um, really using kind of purpose and values to drive the work. Um, and investing the time, investing the time in the dialogue and learning that is required, that's kind of a key aspect of building a trust-based culture. Um, so really a lot of these elements are, we're talking about, yes, making the case, but really kind of making the case and making it stick for the long run. All this work is kind of really required for that. And if we don't do that work, then it's kind of like, you know, the principles are kind of empty without all that other stuff because you know, that, that becomes kind of a one-off strategy. And here we're really talking about how do we ingrain this in our work for the long haul. Um, Phil, I'd love to turn to you. What's coming up for you as you think about kind of challenging tra traditional notions of leadership roles, um, you know, sharing power, seeding power? How does this show up in your work? And, and what is some of the work that, that you continue to do uh, to really kind of embed trust-based values in the work of Robert Sterling Clark. You know, it's been really interesting listening to Brenda and Pia talk about kind of the ways in which we all work and the way that the sector operates, right? We have a, there is a way, if you will. And I think that is so firmly embedded in, in so much of the way that we do our work. It's interestingly, you know, when I think about trust-based philanthropy, the easy part is to think about the grant making side and the six principles and like, oh, I, we do all six of those, so we're trust-based. I would actually invite us to think differently about that and just flip it nuanced on its head, which is that because you are trust-based, you come into it with this kind of value system 
um, those kinds of those principles kind of spill out of that, right? And you do those things and you do those actions as a result of having a particular kind of mindset or approach to engaging with grantee partners and for the and with your, our own staff and with our board as well, right? Um, and so that flip is really sort of saying we when you're leading with values and leading with culture, these things happen as a result of that, and those are, that's the embodiment of that. And so as I kind of was listening, I was thinking about like, how does that play out in our world? And I think part of it is, is if we talk about that whole notion of ecosystem again, right, the board, the staff, our colleagues, and then our, grant, uh, our grantee partners, it, we talk about trust on those different dimensions, but I would say power flows in that way as well. And this whole notion of what role does the board play or what role does, do we as staff play? And, and what are we here for, right? Who are we accountable to has all been part of that conversation, and right? And for us, you know, so much of it, and I know it's, it's, it's one that we all talk about a lot, but it's kind of really coming from a place of curiosity and learning and this whole notion of humility, right? We don't have the answers. We're not the experts. Our grantee partners know more and have a better sense as to what's going on. And so what can we draw from that? And what can we do? Um, right. We all have different roles to play. Right. And as the holders of resources, we get ascribed power. Right. Whether it's earned or deserved or not. Right. It just it, it happens. And so, you know, if you think about trust based in so many of these dimensions, part of it is really trying to flatten that dynamic or balance it in a way. It'll never all go away. But what are ways that we can kind of embody or capture that and reflect that in the way that we engage with one another? Um, that also gets reflected in the way that we do our grant making. And so I think the big thing is this whole notion of, um, we use this term a lot in this trust-based framework, but the, it's our values in action. And it, it goes across um, all the different dimensions of this work. And so I guess the invitation for all of us is to think about like, how does that get reflected in our own work, but also in our own organizations? I love that. You know, it's, um... It's great to think about this work as, as learning. The learning and humility piece of this work um, is actually way more fun because there's always opportunity to learn collectively. It's an opportunity to just learning, even in the context of learning is, it just, it automatically creates space for shared power because it's collective learning. And everyone's insights have, have value in that. And it helps us continuously improve the work. Um, there's so much good stuff there. Um, I also want to really um, br br open it up now to the group because I know we're talking about big pieces around culture building. Um, you know, there's this, there's this question around, okay, great, we're on board, all that culture stuff sounds great, but what if you're still hitting barriers? <laughs> um, I imagine some of you may be. Um, so I'd love to just kind of bring it back to Marcus to reflect a little bit about kind of what is the work of making the case for building collective power? What does that look like? Who needs to be convinced? Um, and then I'd like to open it up to our full group of participants um, to bring your questions to us. What are some areas where you're hitting barriers in, in making the case or um, working toward building a trust-based culture? But Marcus, first let's hear from you. Just what is that work of making the case for collective power building? What does that look like? Who, who needs to be at the table? Who needs to be convinced? Um, I know that's broad, but would love to hear what that's going to be. Yeah, broad, tricky, you know, the, the right question, right? Meaty question. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge there's some really great questions being dropped in the chat box. Uh, please keep those going. I'm going to be super brief here because so much of what I think in response to that question has already been shared. Uh, by our speakers. The one thing I'll, I'll underscore here, though, is uh, through a real reflection over the past few months in particular around this moment, uh, through hearing from uh, colleagues who are feeling as if, like, uh, the term that has come to mind consistently is quiet desperation. We just don't know what to do, but I'm afraid to say that to anyone, right? I'm afraid to acknowledge um, my concerns, my fears, the uncertainty that I'm carrying around this moment. Like that too is actually connected to power, right? And, and I, I offer that the more, the more we see ourselves connected to a group of leaders, right? So no one individual 
or a small group of individuals is holding this um, designation of leadership or power, the more we share it, the more we can enter into spaces of discomfort or awkwardness to grapple together with, uh, it, with emotional safety, without judgment or assessment, in order to get clarity in the areas that we need to move forward. And so what I'm, what I'm offering is that uh, in, in order for us, Shadi, one, one of the components of being able to enter into these spaces and kind of make effective cases is to appreciate that the more we share the responsibility for responding, the more we allow for collective genius to be incorporated into uh, the decision making or problem solving, uh, the richer the result. Right. Uh, the more concentrated that is on one individual, the more pressure to respond, the more we start to introduce uh, self-defeating ideas of needing to get it right, uh, of needing to be perfect. All of these kind of culturally dominant uh, ways of approaching the work that have proven untrue over all of these years. And so. I'll just quickly reframe this as um, there's a component of this that's about decolonizing our thinking. Um, and, and that's to borrow some language from the, the decolonizing wealth work from Edgar Villanueva, where uh, we are looking at the language that we use, thinking about the way in which we interact with each other, like how we shape relationships. Is it strictly trans transactional? Or is there something that characterizes the relationship beyond the transactions that we make, right? In, in tra the, 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 the TBF work, uh, the, the work of uh, trust-based philanthropy uh, really does have the principles in place that if we adhere to these, it allows us to establish the non-transactional uh, relationships that, that really embody the trust that's necessary to facilitate change because ultimately uh, change does happen at the speed of trust. We've heard it before. It probably sounds a little rope and you know at this point it's like yeah 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 but but in actuality if you think about what it takes to facilitate change you think about the awkwardness that I described right the the real feelings that we even talked about entering this call today uh, of uncertainty of not being able to bring my best to the work or feeling like my best is not enough. These are the things that we hear in the re within relationships that have established a certain level of trust so that we can meet each other where we are and move to where we like to be. So I'll just, I'm keeping it broad there, Shadi, because I, it's allowing ourselves to show up fully in our work which is that leadership component that Brenda mentioned. And it's not easy. It takes courage to do that. Um, and we support each other in that work, but we, have, we also commit to cultivating the courage to be able to do the thing that aligns with our vision. And perhaps that too is a form of personal power mm -hmm. that contributes to this conversation of structural power. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for just really reiterating uh, the importance of culture, culture building. Um, and also uh, one thing that you said kind of brought up for me is that, you know, for some, the entry point will be the practices. It will be starting with these practices and kind of seeing the potential of what happens when you unrestrict dollars and the potential and power in that. That's right. Um, that, can, that can sometimes be the entry point. And then once you kind of get a little bit in there, and realize the value that that can be kind of a door opener for conversations around culture collaboration all these other things that we're talking about um so thank you thanks for bringing that up because i am sure for folks on the call today that might resonate for you that maybe just taking that taking one step toward one or two trust-based principles has opened up new conversations in your organization that's a great opportunity to kind of have continued conversation um, so I'd love to kind of sit with that question and bring in a question that we had in the chat box um, for you, Pia, and I'll also invite others on the, on our, uh, among our speakers to address this question. Um, it's this question of what, you know, expanding on this idea of being a staff member that's working within an organization kind of against the cultural grain um, and trying to build buy-in internally. 
Pia, what, you know, what can that look like? You've had a little experience talking to folks who are in that role, um, kind of trying to move culture or practice um, kind of that's in a counterculture way. Mm -hmm. um, so what are, what, what are your suggestions for folks who are in that role? What, does the, what are some ways to kind of think about that work? Sure. Um, and as Judy, I, I really appreciate this question. I'm very sensitive to what it means to be a staff member who doesn't have decision-making power, who isn't the top of the hierarchy, whether we're talking about racial equity work or trust-based and free work. So I have a four-pronged answer. <laughs> Basically, um, I'm sure Phil and Brenda and Marcus will also uh, expand. But first, I think assess, is this the institution for me? Especially as people of color, is it worth it for me to stay? Is it worth it for me to put my life energy into turning a Titanic you know, type situation you know, towards something that feels more aligned with my values? So I would never say to someone, you know, sacrifice your life and your well-being for, you know, racial equity or trust-based philanthropy in your organization. So first, there's like a real assessment. And the truth is, it's a pandemic. And um, it's a very difficult year. So if the, the, if the idea is, um, like, this institution is not for me, but I have, you know, I, 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 I got to pay rent and take care of my babies and, you know, my whatever then cool, maybe you're, maybe, you know, you taking up the torch of trust-based philanthropy or racial equity or racial justice work in your organization, it, not for you, not today. And I don't know, Shadi and I have been listening to the NAP ministry, take more naps. I don't know, there's that, right? So then another <laughs> the way that I think about it is there's enough, there's enough juice. I have enough juice. There's other people in the organization. So first, you know, Brenda always talks about emotional safety. Is there a group within this institution that I have emotional safety with that I can think about, you know, what are the ways that we can try to influence the whole ship, you know, at, at that strategy level, at the grant making level, at the leadership level, if we're not in those positions. And I think that there's probably people on uh, the webinar right now who can be even more um, thoughtful for me <laughs> about, than me about what that could look like. But so find your people um, and, you know, make sure you're not alone, like Marcus was saying, in, in doing tough work. So I think those are like two kind of essential elements of what's what's worth our time and energy and um, life force right now. And then so the other two prongs are, you know, is there an influence strategy we can have? Um, kind of trying to influence up, you know, as we know, funders are often influenced by our peers. Um, so like if are there other funders that we can connect to our institution and say hey look i want you to meet phil phil is you know he used to work in the financial industry he has so many good thoughts about um effective grant making you know maybe phil or brenda or someone like that can be influential with with the actual decision makers so and um, you know and there may be other ways to think about an influencer strategy from within maybe as a group um, maybe in a way that we, you look at who do they listen to the most and how can we bring those like a little bit closer. Um, I'm sure you've already thought of these things if you're in an institution that's countercultural to these, to these um, things that we're talking about. And then lastly, the piece I was talking about before was like, what is our personal agency? So within the sphere of your role or our role, do we have a way that we, I'll give you a really concrete example. I, I don't know how many program officers I've met that are like, we have a competitive application process. It is exhaustive. It tires and taxes every nonprofit leader who tries to fill it out. So what I do is I do my best to like, you know, get them on the phone, you know, get them to tell me everything that we need to hear. I'll put it in a document, send it back to them. Does it look okay? And then like literally I'll input it um, on their behalf because I know they don't have time. They're like putting out fires. They're, you know, doing all this, the work that we are, you know, funding them to do and they just don't have time to spend you know, 40% uh, of their, you know, week trying to apply for a single grant. So there's ways that within our roles, I wonder how we can be collaborative, how we can be allies, like how we can um, be truthful. I think sometimes too, when we work in a foundation, all of a sudden, every cousin, every, you know, <laughs> like every, every friend we've ever had that like needs funding is like, oh, Pia, I'm so glad you work in philanthropy now. So I have this project that's about horses. It has really nothing to do with anything you've ever funded, but clearly like we need to have a meeting and talk about my horses. So just like, I think also just being like very honest that even though I have a role at this foundation, you know, I literally don't have either the you know direction of the portfolio to be able to fund your horses, um, or, you know, or whatever it is, like, I, I think sometimes also just being honest. Um, 
about what, what, what's in our capacity and what isn't. Um, Cause I, you know, asking the question like, where am I not giving up power to, um, you know, a person of color with very deci little decision-making in a large foundation is, is an unfair question in some sense. Um, but it's really about not seeing ourselves as constantly just being subject to power that we can find a way to have our own um, agency. And even if that agency is, oh, thanks Pia, you just helped me clarify that I'm not really invested in this institution, but I knew, but I, you know, but I'm not gonna look for a new job until 2021 cool, thanks. I am going to take more naps. I'm good. You know? So, so I think that's what we have to do when we think about like what, what we're going to invest in an institution. You're on the phone with like three um, CEOs, uh, actually four, you know, CEOs and executive directors. So obviously we've, we've like given up the ghost of our, some huge aspects of our lives to these organizations. And we've been, you know, and so I think that's also true. So I'm just like keeping that in mind as I look at your question. If I can jump in here, Shadi, for a minute, I think um, I think it's important to also not not imagine that you can potentially, depending where you're at, shift the entire Titanic over into this. And so, um, not only what is your role and what is your sphere of influence, but what's where do you start? And I often um, share with my staff that you know I, I grew up in philanthropy. I started out as a program associate and have had every role in between program associate and CEO. And in every step of my career, I have always asked myself the question, what, what can I do differently in my particular role? And it's all of this learning that led me to the point of where I could envision a different foundation and a different model. Um, and so it was a process to get there. Um, and, and I think each of you probably have some idea of what thing you can do within the sphere of your control and influence to start moving an organization um, in the direction of trust-based. Um, and it, even if it's just getting the conversation started, right, with somebody who, who hasn't been part of this. Um, so I think, think, think about baby steps and not feel like you've got to move the entire institution overnight. I love that, Brenda, thank you. Um, any of our other speakers, would you like to comment on this question or add some thoughts? Okay, um, great. Well, thank you for that great question. Please keep your questions coming, especially as you're actively working to build uh, buy-in for this work and this practice. Um, we'd love to hear your very specific questions. Um, you know, I, I, I wanna bring up a question to you, Phil. Um, one thing that we often talk about in the context of trust-based philanthropy is to really <coughs> shift the lens on what we're talking about when we're talking about evaluation. Um, it goes back to your point, Phil, about uh, evalu like learning. This work is about learning, constant learning. And that is how we often talk about evaluation in a trust-based context. It's, it's, it's a learning rather than you know, holding grantees accountable to predetermined outcome measures. Um, so in your work and your time, Phil, you know, what, what advice would you offer folks who are trying to make the case for evaluation more as learning rather than outcomes measurement? Sure. I think what we've been trying to do at uh, the Robert Stone Clark Foundation is really kind of think about ways um, that we can help kind of make the case for um, unrestricted funding and multi-year, but it's also, part of it is also really trying to understand what is happening with our grantee partners, right? So we fund leadership development, so really investing in organizations that run that. So there's a wide array of kind of issues or identity groups that get worked with. But I think the learning stance or the curiosity of really understanding has been really kind of pivotal for us. Um, and this whole notion of um, kind of the expertise being resident with our grantee partners. And so um, often, you know, if you think about other ways and of other approaches, and I'll just sort of point out strategic philanthropy, where a lot of the metrics are decided and driven for you or, um, that come from um, kind of the world of finance where I grew up the first half of my career. Um, this whole idea of kind of flipping it in a different way and saying, we, we talk to our grantee partners and ask, like, what does success look like for you? What do you assess yourselves on? What do you talk to your boards about? What do you talk to your communities about? 
about what you're trying to do, right? For us, that's the best indicator of understanding an organization, what its priorities are, what its values are, right? And are they values aligned with us in terms of that work? And that's a springboard for a conversation. And for us, it's really about given what's happening, like how are you, how are you faring or what's, what are you learning and what, how does that inform your work going forward? And I think for us, that's a huge part of understanding an organization and what it's trying to do. Um, and I think, you know, that, that kind of way of looking at like, what do these dollars offer or what does unrestricted funding offer is part of that conversation. I think the other part of trust-based, and this is kind of, um, is inviting a different lens on how do you look at eva and how do you evaluate things and in the, uh, organizations and, you know, coming from finance, you know, return on investment and other classic measures that are all numerically driven are kind of the classic ways and that's because they're easily measurable and they seemingly are more objective, right? Um, but we worked with some of our external evaluators to say like, as we have moved into this trust-based approach, how can we think about our work in different ways or how can we think about um, gauging our success in that way? And so these evaluators have, who have kind of grown up in a really metrics driven environment um, were kind of put to the task to think about a, a different kind of measure in terms of learning about what kind of ways do they engage with the organization or what kind of conversations are being had or how forthcoming or vulnerable or what have you are. And so they've actually come up with something that we call return on relationship as our counterbalance to return on investment. And it's, I think part of it is like, whether it's perfect or not, I think it's really just an invitation to think differently um, and to open our eyes to the possibilities of what does it mean to think about our work in the ways that we are, are able to be uh, kind of good partners in um, trust-based um, work. And so I think for us, it's really kind of opened our, our doors. We, we use a verbal reporting system called a chat and so it's really this interesting way for us to kind of learn more about our work, ourselves, our grantee partners. Um, and it's a way that we can actually uh, share this information back um, with our board and uh, the community as a whole. Thank you, Phil. And um, for those of you who haven't seen the chat tool that is also available on the, uh, on the Trust Based Philanthropy site, as well as the Robert Sterling Park site, um, we just had a great question come in on this topic of accountability. Um, and I'm just going to read it for all of our speakers and invite um, anyone who's moved to offer a response, please do. On this topic of accountability, I'm wondering how others are addressing accountability within um, and external to the organization. This is a strong value for us, holding people in power accountable, holding ourselves accountable to our values and each other, and ensuring grantees are accountable to community leaders who we think ought to drive the change. So accountability doesn't always feel like trust, but I'm wondering how you all have navigated this. Thanks, Tara, for the great question. Brenda. Um, so I'm, I'm jumping in because this is actually a topic of conversation for my board meeting this week um, because the board has been asking um, about this question. And I think this is sort of the, the, the piece that has been hard to navigate for me of um, the board has allowed me to lead this organization and create a trust-based foundation. And yet they continuously take a step back to saying, and where's ROI? And what, what are the impact we're having? And how are, how are these grantees being accountable to us? And, and how are staff being accountable to you? And how are you being accountable to me? So it is this constant tension that, that is very real um, and that we have to pay attention to. So here's how I'm thinking about it. And I would love to hear how other people are thinking about it because I'm very early on in this exploration. Um, so I have been asking the question, well, accountable to whom and for what, right? Um, and I think uh, generally boards will say, you know, accountability very broadly and not really talk about specifically what, what, are, you, what are you asking? Like, what, what is it that you need to know? Um, and why, why is that important? And I think when you start digging into that, you get down to the nitty gritty of what, what, what folks want. And for us at Headwaters, what accountability has meant to the board has, meant, has come down to a couple of different things. One, we, we do what we say we're doing and the community is better for it. And so I have created what I call a data learning book for our board. And it has two different sections. One section is an accountability section. 
And that section looks at things that we actually should be accountable for and that we can actually track. So they include things like, what do our grantees think that we're being responsive? Are we answering the phone quickly? How, how do grantees rank us relative to other funders in terms of how easy it really is to get money from us? Um, uh, we have a set of specific goals and deliverables that are part of our work plan every year that the board approves. Are we delivering on that? Will we accountable and the team accountable for that? So that's the piece that is, has really driven accountability down towards things that we actually have the ability to influence and control. And then there is a second section of the learning book that I call account, uh, uh, evaluation and learning uh, for learning purposes. And this is where I think we get tripped up because our boards want there to be a difference and it, they want it to be on outcomes and metrics in, 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 when we are doing social change work where we don't control everything, where the environment is and what's happening in the environment has maybe greater repercussions than the $5 million that I put into the issues that we are caring about here in Montana. And so I've said to them, don't hold me accountable for those things that I can't control. Don't hold our grantees accountable for the things that they cannot control. But we should be talking about what does success look like, what's working, what's not working, and how do we use that information to make different strategic decisions about the investments that we make or the things that we need to be doing in order to be supportive of our grantees and our communities. And so that, that framework has been more around learning and it's more storytelling based and it is more um, opportunities to share and to set up conversations that are about learning and learning for our board, learning for our staff, learning for our communities. I'm happy to share, this is in a very early draft, but I'm happy to share what that looks like with folks because I think it then has, or I'm hoping it's gonna create a way or a paradigm for the board to really think about accountability for accountability purposes and then um, evaluation and learning for learning purposes, which are two different things. I love that framing. Um, and it, we're getting a lot of uh, um, eager responses to, to, to take a look at that as you've outlined, Brenda. Um, so we'll make sure to, to get that out to everyone after this call. Um, you know, I'll, oh, yes, Marcus, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, just briefly, I, I, I'm really appreciating this um, question of accountability and particularly how the, the person that asked the question connected it to trust uh, with, a, with a kind of a question mark. Um, and and uh, just as, as it relates to culture, which is one of the angles that I enter into the conversation, I, I would be remiss if I didn't offer a way of how this, this concept of accountability actually uh, relates really well with the invitation that I offer to think about how we view language, to think about how we carry over these dominant cultural values um, that have actually created the kind of separation, this, this us versus them versus the we and, and uh, under, underscores our interconnectedness. And so I, what, I, what I offer and what has been really useful for me, particularly in moments of organizational instability where there's distrust amongst participants in an institution and that's probably none of you so just try to imagine an institution where there's lack of trust um, but the thing that i found useful is consider accountability as uh, what is it that is required in our relationship right in my relationship with myself and my relationship to other people to support them to follow through on the commitment that they have made to themselves and others, right? And so accountability is less about a compliance, which, which can be more of a traditional way of thinking about it, and more of a how, what type of support do I need or might I be able to offer to someone else to live up to their commitment? So it's a living up to commitment, but not from a pejorative compliance approach, but more from a support, more from a, a alignment. So helping people, helping, being open to others, helping you understand when you're operating outside of a way that you have demonstrated 
as your preference or your standard, right? It's the, the misalignment around our standard, standards, which connects to our values and actually deepens trust. When we follow through, we deepen trust and rapport. When we deepen trust and rapport, we set the culture, the grounds for facilitating change. So I, I, uh, this may seem a little bit more abstract, but I hope we appreciate that accountability is critical from the point of view of culture and establishing trust and rapport, how we show up as leaders and support each other uh, to this process. Thank you, Marcus. We're getting a lot of positive feedback on that reframing of living up to our commitment. That also connects back to how Brenda was describing um, the work and how they're thinking about it at Headwaters. Um, so this is just all really, really great. Um, Pia, did, or Phil, did you want to add anything to this conversation? We've got so many different things coming up. I'm good right now. Okay. Um, we want to invite you all to continue to bring in your questions. Um, also, I know that, you know, maybe we're not getting at some of the kind of super skeptical questions you might be getting. Um, I wanted to take a moment to plug uh, the Skeptics Corner uh, resource that we've created. I just popped it into the chat box, um, which is basically answers to the top most frequently asked skeptical questions about trust-based philanthropy. Um, so please take a look at that, and that will probably have some some questions that you maybe have answered or have navigated in this work or questions that may come up. We do get into some of these same themes around accountability, living up to commitment and vision. Um, so please do check those out. I also wanted to make a point that I think Pia brought up. Um, you know, the, the, the existence of the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project is to serve the sector and to contribute to culture shift toward more trust-based culture throughout the sector. So we are here to serve you um, we've got a fabulous steering committee and a whole group of other committed leaders in philanthropy who have uh, agreed to make themselves available to speak with your staff, with your boards, um, to offer some one-on-one -on -one reflection and support as you're moving along this journey. So, so please know that, that we're always here. You can always contact me um, for those connections. We're here. This is what we're here to do. So um, we, we really benefit and we learn from your experiences. So please do bring those to us. Um, and, you know, I, so just those few things I want to mention, because if we're not getting at some of your specific questions, we are here to address those. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, and I've got some of these big questions that I had reserved for this moment. <laughs> um, and maybe I'll come back to this point that you raised, Pia, uh, around this no the, the, the need for systemic equity. Um, and, and I would love to hear from you, how, how can we, I mean, obviously there's a lot more discussion about this than there has been before in philanthropy, um, but how do we make the case, what's the work of, of embedding a vision for systemic equity within the culture of an organization, and, and what is the work of actually making the case for that kind of deeper commitment rather than like the DEI checkbox? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this reminds me of Marcus's comment about this being multi-generational multi work and we have kind of our water to carry related to that. Um, now that you say the phrase systemic equity, I'm like, what did I actually mean by that? I mean, um, I think we have, in our sector can ask ourselves, how are we um, building towards a possibility where basically philanthropy doesn't need to exist, right? Because there aren't so many huge gaps in um, the experiences between different communities in this country. Um, part of that I think is a strong infrastructure um, in terms of government, like both working out a pol on a policy front and um, trying to fill in where government isn't happening. I mean, there's, we haven't even broached the election, but the selection coming up, you know, there's some really powerful work from groups like Black Voters, Black Voters Matter and other groups that are trying to ensure that um, voter suppression doesn't happen or doesn't happen to the extent that it could. Um, so I think, you know, we have always had a value for a strong, inclusive, deep democracy at trust-based philanthropy, and that still is true. And I think if we really had 
um, that at a, at a systems level around health and education and um, economy, uh, jobs, you know, access to the, the very basics, um, if that was happening through, you know, some level of a strong public infrastructure, which we can advocate for as, a, as philanthropies in a lot of different ways, I think there would be less of a need for us. Um, so that's what comes to mind in the moment. I think also being, being transparent and direct that a lot of the, the basic overarching mainstream cultural philanthropy is a, a, is a, a white kind of academic um, framework that doesn't, doesn't center experience. Um, especially direct experience of the problems. So I think there's something in, in, in there um, to think about. I think thinking, looking at our systems themselves, at our policies, at our internal organizational practices and behaviors um, with an equity lens. It's how, how we treat our own workers, our vendors, our partners. Um, I know that there's lots of folks that have been looking in that direction. And, um, and then Philanthropy doesn't lead social and political and economic movements, right? We, we support them. So I think the last thing is, you know, looking towards the, the existing really powerful movements of our time to um, see how we can be a support. And earlier in the chat, this is the last thing I'll say today is earlier in the chat, I called out this really great new collective fund that has come out um, led by the Libra Foundation. And it is called um, the Democracy Frontlines Fund. And it centers, you know, 10 um, Black-led, um, Black movement, national movement leading organizations, including Black Voters Matter, as 10 organizations that are going to all receive $36 million. And so I think, you know, supporting those kinds of efforts, if they're not coming from our direct institutions, is another way that we can be a part of the longer, deeper, wider systems change that is required um, in this country. Thanks. Thank you, Pia. Um, so with just a few minutes left, um, I'd like to just invite all of our speakers to offer a piece of advice um, to the folks who are on the call today. Um, you know, assuming that you're all leaders um, working to advance a shift in practice and culture at your organizations in various ways, um, you're on a journey, right? This is, this is not, um, we always say this is, a journey, not a checklist. It's a process. You know, even our speakers that have all these fantastic insights and experience around building buy-in for trust-based philanthropy, they too are on a journey um, and continue to learn um, and continue to refine in that process. So um, I know it's kind of a cliche, but we are genuinely in this journey together. Um, we're learning together. Um, but I would love to um, bring it back to our speakers to just offer one final piece of advice or word of motivation to our colleagues who you know maybe are working collectively as a team or maybe working just as a single entity um, within a, an organization trying to you know push a boulder up a hill but still doing that good work what what is one piece of advice or or guidance you would offer our folks today um, and we'll start with you phil hi everyone um, I'm actually going to start really small and then hopefully everyone else keep building. Um, often we keep asking, people ask like, how do I get started? How do I really do this? And how do I change this work? And, and where can we actually see something tangible happen quickly? And so my guidance would be, um, I'll invite you to fill out your own grant application. And um, that's just a small snippet, but it gives you the experience of what it means to be a grant seeker. And it actually helps reveal what you're actually asking and what you use or don't use as the case may be. And it offers a chance to streamline. And that's just one of the six principles, but it's one that is actionable and that you can actually take um, and carry forward kind of hopefully very quickly. So, and that hopefully will get you started on this, uh, a larger frame, but it's, it's, it can be eye-opening. Uh, I'll just leave a bit at that. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, fill out your own application process, invite your leadership team and board perhaps to go through that process too. That could be another um, way to make the case. Um, how about you, Marcus? What's one piece of advice or just a reflection for our folks today? 
Thank you. I love following Phil. He's like one of my favorite leaders <laughs> in the space. Several of the folks on this call are. Um, two things uh, in terms of like honest um, things that come to mind in this moment in response to your invitation. Um, it's um, uh, picking up on what Phil mentioned about starting where you are. Again, I, I, you mentioned, Shadi, how some of this uh, sounds cliche and may feel cliche. But I really, I really want to underscore the importance of demystifying the work that we do as grant makers. Right? Philanthropy has existed beyond, before the institutions themselves. This is an institutional approach to the philanthropy that is common to all traditions around the world. Uh, let's revisit, reclaim some of the wisdom of our cultural forms of philanthropy, um, and then dare to grapple. Um, the, the invitation from me is to actively grapple with colleagues, with each other in these spaces to I, address the gaps that we have identified in alignment within our institutions. My experience in literally doing this uh, as a part of the GEO ecosystem uh, for Grantmakers for Effective Organization is that the grappling process builds resiliency and deepens our practice and proficiency to be able to respond to the next set of uncertain circumstances that are predictably around the corner because things happen in cycles, right? And so, as, as leaders, let's, let's resist the urge to believe that there's this perfection that exists. And if only we uh, operate within a space that is devoid of conflict, then we've gotten it right. I suggest that that will never happen and that the tensions that we're existing and the uncertainty that is facing us is actually an invitation into deeper more profound practice if we just open ourselves up to it as leaders. Thank you, Marcus. How about you, Brenda? One, one final kind of reflection for folks today. You just have to start wherever you are. I think just staying on this theme, um, every foundation is going to be in a different place and um, and you have to figure out where, where it is that you are, where is it that your foundation and then uh, begin to to set up ways to have these conversations um, and I, you know one of the things that I often tell people is that you know if you just engage in the conversations with folks about why trust-based philanthropy matters at this particular moment you can pretty quickly get almost any group of people to say yes of course that makes sense um, and so if you if you're going to start someplace start with having the conversations and figure out who those conversations have to be sometimes it may have to be with your staff sometimes your board sometimes your even your grantees. Um, so even if you can figure out where those conversations need to begin and one tool that I'm Shadi, I don't know if you've mentioned it already or if it was sent out ahead of time, which is the trust based philanthropy self reflection tool. I think that's a good tool to use to begin to suss out where does the conversation need to start within my organization? Um, and you utilizing that as a starting point. And then the last thing I'll say, it is a journey. And there are a lot of times when we at Headwaters feel like we're taking three steps forward and then we'll have to take two steps back. Um, and that's just the nature of this work. It's nature of any change, uh, uh, change effort uh, that you do. And so understanding that and not getting bogged down in the frustration of that, so long as you continue to make forward progress. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Wise words. Um, before we wrap, I have a big announcement to make <laughs> that we have another webinar series coming up. This is not the end. So if you want to join us for more discussion about some of these deeper aspects of the practice, we are thrilled to announce um, we, we are launching a webinar series in partnership with Philanthropy California and GEO. Uh, starting in late November after the election when we hopefully have a little bit more breathing room um, to think about this stuff. Um, so stay tuned. It will, you'll get a, um, some information about that in the follow-up email. Um, but essentially that series is called the ethos of being trust-based. We're going to be digging into the values and dispositions, what it looks like, the inter inner work that needs to happen, the inter-organizational work, 
Um, so some of this like less tangible stuff of a trust-based approach, we will be digging into. We hope you'll join us. Um, we're also gonna be sending you a survey because uh, Philanthropy California and GEO are interested in kind of formulating some kind of loose peer learning around this follow-up series. Um, we're still figuring out what that's gonna look like, but if you have ideas, thoughts, needs that we can support, we wanna hear from you. So we'll be sending a survey out about that. It will be a little bit different from our previous surveys on these events. We really wanna know what we can create to serve you. Um, so this is not the last you've seen of us. <laughs> um, and we're here um, to support you in your journey. Please keep your questions coming. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for staying, staying on late at such a crazy time in our planet. Um, but we're so grateful to you and look forward to seeing more of you and, and sharing more stories um, in the coming months. Um, but with that, we hope you have a lovely day. And special thanks again to Philanthropy California to the team at Northern California Grantmakers that ran this whole show today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you to our speakers for being so awesome, so honest, so open, um, so insightful. We appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for being here. Um, we'll, we'll hope to see you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Hello. <laughs>